the kings of this world usually wear a crown. A crown communicates power. It communicates authority. It communicates dominion over a territory, a region, a crown, a majestic crown, perhaps a real one with gold, precious stones. People is supposed to bow before them and also people is supposed to serve them. They don't come to serve, they come to be served. However, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, didn't come with a crown. In fact, he came in a stable full of animals, surrounded not by angelical beings at that precise moment, but then the Lord Show us the true example of being humble. There was no place for him at the inn. He was rejected among all. And there in a stable, it was the majestic presence, the incarnation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Today, we continue with our sermon series titled, All Things New and we have been talking about the letter of joy, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote about joy. The unusual thing about this letter is that Paul's situation was not easy. There appeared to be no reason for him to be rejoicing. He was a Roman prisoner and his case was coming up shortly. He might be freed or beheaded at Chapter 28 indicates that he was a prisoner in his own hired house and he was chained to a Roman soldier and he wasn't permitted to preach. Paul had wanted to go to Rome as a preacher, but he went to Rome as a prisoner. Instead of arriving and being joyful as he received the news, in fact, some Christians were making things very difficult for him. And the question that surfaces our minds are, how in the world Paul was joyful regardless of all the things that were happening to him? He was joyful. And he develops this uh, argument in this epistle of joy, and he talks about the thieves that rob you of your joy, the, the stealers of your joy. And he talks about the circumstances. And most of us, Confess that when things are going our way, we are a lot happier. We are much easier to live with. We have no control over the weather or over the traffic or the people, what they say or what they do. So the person whose happiness depends on the ideal circumstances is going to be miserable most of the time. Then he also talks about people. And how many times we say people, people, people. The world would be better without some people, right? Don't say amen to that. That's, that's fleshly. The third thing is uh, things, possessions. We could be overly concerned for what we have or for what we do not yet have. Possessions could also steal our joy. But the best one and the most difficult one and the one that we always experiment and experience is worry. This is the worst thief of all. How many people have been robbed of peace because of the fulfillment of worry in their lives every single day? In fact, 80% of the things that you worry about never happen. Never happen. So then Paul develops his argument about four attitudes that help you keep your joy, which he explains in each chapter, four chapters. The first chapter, he talks about the single mind. And we talked about this last week. That's why he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he also says, he's not finished with me yet. Then in chapter 2, he talks about the submissive mind. It focuses on people, Christ first, then people. Then in the third chapter, 
he talks about the spiritual mind. This is the contrast between earthly things and spiritual things. Then in chapter 4, he talks about the secure mind. The secure mind. So in chapter 1, Paul puts Christ first. And in chapter 2, he puts others second, which means that he puts himself last. <laughs> the reason that people aggravate us so much is usually because we do not have our own way. As we commonly hear, it is my way or there is no way. If we go through life putting ourselves first and others go through life putting themselves first, at many times there are going to be terrific battles. Let's read what the Word of God says in the first 11 chapters, 11 verses of chapter 2 of Philippians. This is good. This is one of the best scriptures in the whole scripture. If we could encapsulate the work of Jesus, this is one of these chapters. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do not do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. When Epaphroditus brought a generous gift, okay, don't name your grandson Epaphroditus, okay? <laughs> he was coming and bringing news from the church at Philippi. He also brought bad news of a possible division in the church family. People can rob us of our joy. Paul was facing his problems with people at Rome as well as people in Philippi. There was a double threat in the church. False teachers coming from without and disagreeing members from within. I hope this was not a Baptist church. Paul knew that there is a difference between unity and uniformity. The spiritual unity comes from within. It comes from the heart. It comes from having Christ. Uniformity is the result of pressure from without. We strive for unity in our church, even though we could be very different. The first service, the second service, the great whole service, the Spanish service. You're Anglo, I'm Colombian. Imagine that. We are very different. But we are one through the baptism of the Holy Spirit through Christ. Therefore, Paul opened this section appealing to the highest possible spiritual motive. Since believers at Philippi were in Christ, and since believers here at Par Cities are in Christ, then we are encouraged to work toward unity and love, not toward any type of division. Paul wanted them to see that the basic cause for selfishness and the cause of selfishness is pride. There can be no joy in the life of a Christian who puts himself or herself above others. The secret of joy in spite of circumstances is the single mind in Christ. 
And the secret of joy in spite of people is the submissive mind in Christ. So in Philippians chapter 1, it is Christ first. And in Philippians 2, it is others next. Paul is the sole winner in chapter 1, and he becomes the servant in chapter 2. This chapter talks about humility. And humility is that grace that when you know you have it, you have lost it. Let me repeat it again. Humility is that grace that when you know you have it, you have already lost it. Others is the key idea of this chapter. Paul gives us four examples of a submissive mind. He talks about Christ in the first 11 verses. Then he talks about himself in the next verses. And then about Timothy and then about Epaphroditus. Now let's look about the attitude, the new attitude that we can develop through Christ. The first 11 verses. The first attitude is thinking of others, not ourselves. Thinking of others, not ourselves. Verse 3 to 6 says, Do nothing out of self-ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. We see here total self-denial. The path to greatness, biblically speaking, is self-denial. The path to greatness is self-denial. The path to worthy thinking is self-ambition. The way to do this is by putting value on others above ourselves. And fellows, this is totally contradictory to our human tendency. This is different and difficult without Christ. Instead of asking ourselves, what's in it for me? We have to ask ourselves, what's in it for you? What's in it for others? And this is the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? Well, the mind of Christ means the attitude that Christ exhibited. Your attitude, my attitude, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. After all, outlook determines outcome. Outlook determines outcome. If the outlook is selfish, the actions will be divisive and destructive. Then these verses, the kenosis, theologically speaking, takes us to eternity past. The phrase form of God has nothing to do with the shape or size. God is spirit. John chapter 4 tells us that. And as such, is not to be taught in human terms. The word of God uses human terms to describe divine attributes, the characteristics of God, and the activities of God. The word form in the original means the outward expression of the inward nature. This means that the, in eternity past, Jesus was God. Paul stated that Jesus was with God, equal with God. Paul stated that Jesus was equal with God. Other verses also mention that Jesus is God. John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1. As God, Jesus did not need anything. He had all the glory and praise of heaven. He reigned over all the universe with the Father and the Spirit but in Philippians 2, 6, it states an amazing, wonderful fact. It says, he did not consider his equality with God as something selfishly to be held on to. He did not consider his equality with God as something selfishly to be held on to. Jesus did not think about himself. He thought about others. The mind of Christ is an attitude that says, I cannot keep my privileges for myself. I must use them for others. And to do this, I will gladly lay aside and pay whatever price is necessary. Oh, it looks, it sounds great, but it's difficult to do. For example, it would be worthwhile to contrast Christ's attitude with that of Lucifer, Satan, and Adam and Eve. 
Many Bible scholars believe that the fall of Lucifer is a description of the fall of Satan. He once was the highest of the angelical beings, close to the throne of God in Ezekiel chapter 28. But he desired to be on the throne of God. Lucifer said, I will. But Jesus said, thy will. Lucifer was not satisfied to be a creature. He wanted to be the creator. Jesus was the creator. He willingly became man. Christ's humility is a rebuke to Satan's pride. Lucifer invited others to rebel against God and Adam had all that he needed. He was, in a sense, the king of God's creation. Remember in Genesis chapter 1 when Jesus said, let him have dominion, authority. But Satan said, you will be like God. In his selfishness, Adam sinned against God and therefore the whole human race, you and I included. Adam and Eve thought of only themselves, but Jesus Christ thought of others. We expect unsaved people to be selfish and grasping and grumpy and all the other characteristics you want to add on. But not of a person that lives by the Holy Spirit. More than 20 times in the New Testament, God teaches us how to live with one another. We are to prefer one another. We are to edify one another. We are to bear each other's burdens. We are not to judge one another, but rather admonish one another. Others is the key word for a believer, a disciple that develops a submissive mind. But what else can we do? Well, secondly, taking the attitude of a servant. Not thinking of ourselves, but others, but then taking the attitude of a servant. And Jesus exemplifies this. Verse 7. Rather, comma, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thinking of others is an abstract concept and we must get down to the nitty-gritty of true service. Jesus thought of others, but he became a servant. So the way of doing that is being humble. And Paul traced the steps of the humiliation, the kenosis of Christ. First, he emptied himself, laying aside the independent use of his own attributes as God. Secondly, he permanently became human in a sinless physical body. Thirdly, he used that body to be a servant. Fourth, he took that body to the cross and willingly died. Oh, what a savior we have in Jesus. From heaven to earth, from glory to shame, from master to servant, from life to death, even death on the cross. Let me repeat it. Park City is Baptist Church. From heaven to earth, from glory to shame, from master to servant, from life to death, even death on a cross. Can I get an amen for that? You got to help me out here. When Christ was born at Bethlehem, he entered in a permanent union with humanity from which there could be no escape. He willingly humbled himself so that he might lift us up. Paul used the, the word form again. Jesus did not pretend to be a servant. He was not an actor playing role. He was, in fact, a servant. He was God, man, deity, and humanity united in one. And he came as a servant. Have you noticed that as you read the Gospels, it is Jesus the one servant? He ministers to all kinds of people, fishermen, tax collectors, the sick, the demon-possessed, the unpopular, the outcasts. Women, Matthew 20, 28 says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give, and the original is to sacrifice his life as a ransom for many. In the upper room, when his disciples apparently refused to minister, Jesus got up, 
laid aside his other garments and he put on the long linen towel and watched his disciples feed. He took the place of a slave. This was the submissive mind in action, brothers and sisters. He was willing to sacrifice. Being willing to be humble by being willing to sacrifice. Many people is willing to serve others if it doesn't cost them anything. But if there is a price, they suddenly lose interest and they say, I didn't sign up for that, okay? Jesus became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. One minister said, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. I think he was right. If there is nothing to be paid, Jesus paid on the cross. But we also have to be obedient. There was a missionary in a Brazilian festival, and he looked at a booth that on top of it, it says, sheep crosses. He taught, and he said, that's what many Christians are looking for these days, cheap crosses. My Lord's cross was not cheap. Why should mine be? The Bible tells us that there is one who has pioneered and perfected the race of faith. His name is Jesus. Amen? He not only ran the race of faith, he made it what it is. He invented it. And he conquered it through the cross. Fellows, no other symbol incorporates passion and promise like the cross. Jesus said, carry your cross daily and follow me. The cross is both vertical and is horizontal. Vertically, we stay connected to God, his kingdom, eternal life, spiritual truth, and divine principles and glory. Horizontally, to our left and to our right, we exist surrounded and revealed through our community, relationships, family, culture, and society. Simply stated, the cross is both vertical and horizontal. Oh, it is both redemption and relationship. Oh, it is both covenant and it is community. It is both kingdom and it is society. It is righteousness and justice. It is salvation and it is transformation. It is ethos, but it is also pathos. It is John 3.16 and it is also Matthew 25. It is Billy Graham and it is also Martin Luther King Jr. It is faith and it is public policy. It is prayer and it is activism. It is sanctification and it is service. It is the kingdom of God in Dallas and around the world through the ages of transformation at Park City Baptist Church. Woo! I got an Amen. Jesus replaced the crown, the crown of a king. Instead, instead he took the crown of thorns. What an example is this? This is painful just to put it for a little bit. Imagine. The creator of the whole world decided to use, to use, instead of this, this crown. What a savior we have in Jesus. At a church council planning meeting of a youth Sunday school program, one of the members suggested that the teenagers serve as ushers and leading worship and bring special music. And one of the teenagers had stood up and said, Quite frankly, we are just tired of doing that. We want something more challenging this year. We would like to do something difficult and maybe keep it going all year long. The kids have talked about it and prayed about it and they would like to work with our trustees in remodeling the basement. This was a small church, okay? Not poor cities. So it could be used as a classroom we also would like to start visiting our elderly members every week. And in fact, every Sunday afternoon, we would like to go and do evangelism in the park. Is that okay with you? The pastor and the congregation stood up and said, Amen. We second that. I don't know if it happened or not. But I think we are ready for more. 
in our Christian walk. The test of a submissive mind is not just how much we are willing to take in terms of suffering, but how much we are willing to take in terms of sacrifice. What's in it for others? This is one of the paradoxes of the Christian life. The more we give, the more we receive. The more we sacrifice, the more God blesses. Therefore, the submissive mind leads to joy because it makes us more like Christ. Sharing not only his suffering, but his sacrifice. Thirdly, living for the glory of God. Verse 9 to 11 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue and knowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The goal of our lives is to glorify the Lord. Jesus humbled himself for others, and God highly exalted him. The result of his exaltation is glory to God. Our Lord's exaltation began with his resurrection. When men buried the body of Jesus, that was the last thing any human hands did to him. From that point on, it was God who worked. Men had done the worst to the Savior, but God exalted him and honored him. Men gave him names of ridicule and slander, but the Father gave him a glorious name. Just as in his humiliation, he was given the name Jesus, so that in his exaltation, he was given the name Lord of Lords. He arose from the dead and returned to victory in heaven, ascending to the Father's throne. So the whole purpose of Christ's humiliation and exaltation is to glorify God. Jesus has been exalted with all the authority over all creatures on heaven, on earth, and under the earth. All will bow to him. One day, people from every tribe, every nation, we come before his presence. It doesn't matter if you were born in Dallas or the United States or South America, Asia, Africa, we shall come before the Lamb and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As Jesus faced the cross, the glory of the Father was his uppermost in his mind. He said these words, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son might glorify you. In fact, he has given this glory to us. And one day we shall share it with him in heaven. What a savior we have in Jesus. The work of salvation is more greater and grander than simply the salvation of a lost soul. As wonderful as that is. Our salvation has its ultimate purpose to glorify God. We are to bring glory to him. So as we sacrifice and as we serve others, we are bringing glory to God. Joseph suffered and served for 13 years, but then God exalted him and made him the second one, the ruler in Egypt. David was anointed king when he was young, he experienced years of hardship and suffering, but at the right time, God exalted him as a king over Israel. What about you today? First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. So what do we do today, church? Let us be like-minded through Christ. Let us crucify our ego, me, myself, and I, to the cross. And let us serve others today. And today, church, we have a tangible way of doing this. We are going to place ourselves last and put others second because Christ is first. Amen? 
we're going to take a moment to write a note. You have been given this in the bulletin, and we're going to take two minutes to write a note. This is the way that we are going to respond. And if you are tuning in online, you can do that, and you can bring it to the church office or mail it to us. We're going to write a note to the health workers and professionals. We're going to write a note to the firefighters, the first responders this week. Whatever it is in your heart, let's write it right now. Let's take a moment to do so. Let's place ourselves last. Let's take a moment, church. We could encourage them. We can let them know how much we love them. How much God loves them too. We can offer our verse, our favorite verse perhaps. We could let them know that they are our heroes. We can let them know that we are praying for them. That's so meaningful. Let us not think about ourselves today for a moment. Let us think about others. Philippians 2, 3 says, Do nothing out of self-ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. As we continue to write these notes, you pray for this note and for the person that will be receiving it. Lord, you are so good to us. We thank you for your presence in our midst today. We thank you for the supreme sacrifice, the example of a servant coming in a form of a human being and dying on the cross for all of our sins. Lord, help us to be Light-minded, help us to crucify our ego, help us to serve others. Today, we present ourselves as living sacrifices before your throne of grace. Would you empower us? Would you help us? Would you guide us? Would you do what you can only do? Would you work through us your perfect will? And thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for allowing us to have a relationship with you through, our, through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, your will, not our will. That's our prayer today. In the name that is above all names, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.